morning, if you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, I'd ask you to open to the book of 1 John. The book of 1 John. John and I had the privilege this morning of leading worship at Chapel in the Pines. Uh, we had a great time there this morning uh, as I kind of gave an abbreviated version of the message that I preached here a couple of weeks ago uh, about the Lord's grace being sufficient for all of us and the promise of grace that we find in the Lord. Today, as we finish up our series, Sweet Like Honey, we're going to be talking about the last promise uh, that we see throughout these four. If you remember, uh, we've spent some time talking about them. We talked about the promise of goodness. We talked about the promise of grace. We talked about the promise of rest. And this morning, we're going to talk about the promise of forgiveness. You see... I'm glad that you're here this morning, but the promise of forgiveness, without it, none of the others really matter, right? Without forgiveness, without a relationship with Christ, grace is not really something that we understand. Rest in Christ is not something that we really understand. The goodness of God is not something that we really understand. And so as we've been walking through these promises of God in a series that we've called Sweet Like Honey, which came from Psalm 119, 103 that says, How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. These verses remind us just how sweet God's word is and how how, how sweet the promises that he has for us are. And and again, as we've talked over the last few weeks, we've talked about a, a few different promises, but today we want to close by talking about this promise of forgiveness. Maybe you're here today and you'd say, well, I've got all this junk in my life and I need forgiveness. And I think back to a time when I was 15 years old. I had been saved for several years and I felt God tugging on my heart to do ministry full time. And I was like, God, I've got so many other things that I want to do besides ministry. And I tried to run from that for almost a year. And I remember it like it was yesterday. I was involved in a church, but I didn't, I I didn't, I wanted to kind of break that involvement a little bit because I wanted to loosen my relationship with the Lord a little bit. I remember thinking, if I'm just not as involved, maybe he'll leave me alone. But I still wanted to go to church, so I started visiting and going to church with friends. And I'll never forget that everywhere I went, it was like every message that I heard was about surrendering to, our, to, to the calling that God had on our lives. For almost a year, I ran from the calling that God had on my life. And I remember when I, when I finally succumbed to the pressure of, of God just laying it on me, I remember feeling shame and I remember thinking to myself, God, why did I do this? Why did I run away? Why did I not just listen and follow you? I need you to forgive me of that. And to this day, sometimes I think to myself, what would that year have been like if I had just surrendered? What kind of opportunities could I have had that year that I was running from ministry if I would just have surrendered to the Lord and done what He called me to do. You see, today we're going to be talking about forgiveness. And I asked forgiveness that day. It's a quality that is involved in God's character. He wants to forgive us. It's a quality of Him that we're invited to simply receive. There's nothing that we can do that's enough to get forgiveness. It's something that we just have to receive When we talk about forgiveness, we must also discuss what's required of us. Because there are some things that the gift is free, but there are some things that we have to do in order to receive it. And along the way, we have to come to the conclusion that all of us are here and we're here today and we have something in common. Even as believers and non-believers, we all have something in common. We're all sinners in need of forgiveness. We're all sinners in need of forgiveness. Romans 3.23 tells us about that. It says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. 
The Bible says all of us have at some point, probably, if we were honest, even on the way to church this morning, have fallen short of God's glorious standard. We've fallen short of what God has said is the standard for Christianity. Another way to say this is we are not perfect. There's no way that we can be. And this is the reason that we need a Savior so bad. And that Savior is Jesus Christ. He's made a way for us to receive forgiveness for our sins so that we may experience new and abundant life. But what does this concept and promise of forgiveness actually look like? We talk about it a lot, but I want us today to understand exactly what it looks like. It's important for us to understand that it's as God's people. So this morning, I want to look at three things that are required of us to receive forgiveness. There are many amazing passages and verses of Scripture throughout the Bible that talk about forgiveness. It's kind of like when we talked about grace. I made the comment that grace is dripping from every page in the Bible. And I would venture to say that forgiveness also is one of those things that's dripping from nearly every page in the Bible. We couldn't possibly cover all of the places throughout Scripture today is that it talks about, uh, about forgiveness. But I want to tackle a few of them today and to help us understand the process, the power, and the promise of forgiveness. So if you've turned your Bibles to 1 John chapter 1, I just want to read one verse of Scripture, and it's verse 9. And it says this, If we confess our sins... He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Would you pray with me? God, I thank you for today. God, I thank you for the opportunity that we have to gather in this place and to sing praise to your name. God, I thank you for the opportunity that we have the opportunity to gather and to dive into Scripture and to study Your Word. God, I pray that over the next few minutes as we talk about the promise of forgiveness, God, I pray, Lord, that You would help us to see from Your Word, from this one passage, this one verse of Scripture, God, three things that are required of us to receive forgiveness. Lord, it's in Your gracious and loving heavenly name we pray today. Amen. First thing, it's the very first words in the verse of Scripture. If we confess our sins. Friends, in order to receive forgiveness, we must be willing to confess that we have a problem. And that problem is, again, something that we all have in common. We're all sinners. We all probably sinned, like I said, on our way to church this morning. The first step in this process after we sin against God is actually one that we must initiate. Notice I said a few moments ago that the gift is free. It is free, but we must initiate forgiveness. The Bible says that we need to confess our sins to our Heavenly Father. We must confess our sins to a Father who is listening Friends, Jesus made a way for us to communicate with Him. He made a way for us to communicate with the Father And the Scripture actually says that He intercedes for us at the right hand of the Father. Romans 8.34 says, Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for you and me. This means that when we cry out to God, when we confess our sins, asking Him for something like forgiveness... Jesus Christ is the mediator between us and our Father. He's the one that goes between. We have no right to be in any sort of communication with a perfect, holy God unless Jesus had made a way, and He did, through through dying on the cross, going to a grave, and then raising again three days later. Because of this, even after we mess up, even after we sin, we can approach the throne of God boldly. And friends, we must confess. Hebrews 4.16 says, Let us then with confidence 
knowing that He is going to hear, draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Remember last two weeks ago we talked about the concept of grace? We need to remember that God's ultimate desire is to show grace and mercy and compassion to sinners just like you and I. And He does this through forgiveness. But we must recognize our need. We must be willing to confess. We must be willing to understand that we have a problem. And this is where the confession comes into play. We must pray. And after we confess our sin to God, it's time for us to receive forgiveness. Notice what the verse says in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive. He is faithful and just to forgive. Here's what I would argue today. Accepting the fact that God forgives us and accepting God's forgiveness for ourselves are two very different things. Accepting, God's, accepting the fact that God forgives and accepting God's forgiveness for ourselves are two different things. And often, one is easier than the other. It's very easy to accept the fact that all throughout the pages of this Bible, these holy scriptures that God talks about forgiveness. And we understand that it is a fact that God forgives. But it is imperatively hard sometimes to accept that forgiveness. Because we think about all of the things that we've done wrong. We think about our shame. We think about our guilt. Maybe you've been there in that place before where you were saying, I'm not good enough for God to forgive. Why would He want to forgive me? I've done too many bad Friends, no matter what we've done, no matter what our life has looked like, when we cry out to God confessing our sin and asking Him to forgive us, the Bible promises us that He will. The Bible makes it clear that's exactly what He offers is a free gift of forgiveness when we confess our sins and cry out to Him. But first, we want Jesus' thoughts on it. We, 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 we want to find ourselves feeling the weight and the shame that go along with our sin and the condemnation that comes with our sin. But I want you to know today that that's not the voice of God that's putting that, those thoughts in us. It's not the voice of God because God wants to forgive us. Condemnation does not come from the mouth of God. There's a powerful story in the book of John in chapter 8. And it's about a woman who was caught in adultery. Many of you may remember the story. The religious leaders brought her out for a crowd, uh, which included Jesus. He was there. And they were going to stone this lady to death. And Jesus looked at him and he said, You who are without sin, throw the first stone. To which the stone started dropping. They started falling to the ground. And they didn't want to stone her anymore because they realized, the religious leaders realized what was going on. And so, this lady standing there before Jesus, he looks at her and after they've, they've dropped their stones and walked away, and it's only Jesus and the lady left standing there. Verse, chapter 8 of, John, of, of the book of John, verse 10 and 11 say this. Jesus stood up and said to her, Where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. You see, Jesus was standing there. Religious, these leaders had asked Jesus' opinion on what, they, what, what he should do, what they should do. They're all there ready to stone this lady. And Jesus tells them, let the, one of you who is without sin throw the first stone. To 
which they all drop their stones and walk away. And it's just Jesus and the lady. And he asks her, who's here? Who's here to condemn you? Did any of them condemn you? Where are your accusers is what he was asking. Didn't even one of them condemn you? And after all is said and done, Jesus sends her on her way, not with condemnation, but with a commission to go and sin no more. That's a picture of Jesus' forgiveness. Jesus could have completely held that adultery above that woman's head. But He forgave her just like He forgives you and I. And He doesn't condemn us. He forgets it. He throws our sin as far as the east is from the west and gives us a commission to go and sin no more. When we understand what God's voice actually sounds like, we start to believe that forgiveness is truly available to us as well. When we start to realize what God's voice actually sounds like, we stop hearing the, Chris, you're not good enough. Chris, what about this? Chris, what about that? Remember when you did this? Remember when you said that? God doesn't remember those things. He doesn't hold those over my head. He forgives me of those things. So when we begin to understand what His voice sounds like, then we're able to accept that forgiveness and not just understand it as a fact. It isn't just some biblical thing that we read about that's available to us as well. It isn't just some uh, thing that we read that uh, is available to people with less sin than us. Instead, it's a present reality for all of those who would come to Jesus and accept it. We are washed clean by the blood of Jesus. And He is the Savior of all mankind. He wants to forgive us. Again, we must confess our sins. We must receive that forgiveness. Number three this morning, I think we have to be cleansed from unrighteousness. We must be cleansed from all unrighteousness. It says that in 1 John chapter 1, if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from unrighteousness. Friends, you and I are cleansed. It seems that verse, there's an outcome of receiving forgiveness in our lives. The Bible talks a lot about the cleansing power of Jesus and how He wipes things as far as the east is from the west. And this morning, i got a board up here and I've just written some things that we deal with on it. Most of these are probably things that at some point or another we've dealt with. Anger, if you can't see them over there, I'm just going to read them out. Anger, greed, lust, drunkenness, pride, unforgiveness, idolatry, disobedience, jealousy, lying, laziness, selfishness. The list goes on and on and on and on and on, right? What does Jesus mean when He cleanses us from all unrighteousness? I believe when we ask Jesus, when we confess our sins, and Jesus is just and faithful to forgive us, and then it says that He cleanses us from all unrighteousness. I believe this is what He does, essentially. He wipes these things away, and they are no more. They're gone. We don't have to worry about the things that we've dealt with in our past. We don't have to worry about the fact that maybe I was selfish. Maybe I was lazy. Maybe I was prideful. Maybe I was greedy. When God forgives us, He cleanses us from unrighteousness. This is what God does for us when we receive His forgiveness. He wipes it away. And here's what the promise of God tells us by the prophet Isaiah. It says, Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. Friends, the red is gone. We see the white of Jesus because He's forgiven us. He's covered our sins He's wiped them away. When we receive receive that forgiveness of God, 
we're transformed. You see, this is where God's sacrificial offering of Jesus comes into play. Because of His blood that He shed on the cross for you and me, our sins are forgiven. As we seek to walk with Jesus day by day, we will start doing things differently. We'll start doing things His way. And hopefully further and further from the sins that so often entangle us. But here's where we got to be a little bit more like Jesus. Here's the hard part, okay? We confessed Him. He forgave us. He cleansed us. He wiped our slate clean. But the problem is, is I keep going back. And as I go back and I remember about the selfish desires that I had, I start having those selfish desires again. As I go back and I think about the greed that I had, I go back and I start having those greedy thoughts again because it's like it creeps back in. Friend, we've got to let it go the way that our Father lets it go. As we talked about earlier in this series, Sweet Like Honey, God promises to never leave us nor forsake us. He desires to walk every step, step by step with us by our side. And He desires for us to live a holy, righteous life free from sin. 1 Peter 1.16 says this, For it is written, Be holy because I am holy. Friends, to be holy is to be set apart. And all of our efforts, all of our works, all of our things that we do, holiness was not something that we could accomplish on our own. Holiness is only accomplished through a relationship with Jesus. We needed another avenue and opportunity to receive divine forgiveness. It couldn't just be for a season or a month. We needed a permanently restored relationship. And thankfully, through Jesus, through the blood that was shed on the cross, this kind of forgiveness and restoration is possible. I want to read 1 John 1, 9 one more time. If we confess with our sins that He is faithful and just to forgive, He will cleanse us from all of our unrighteousness. Friends, is there a sweeter promise in God's Word than to know that we can receive His forgiveness and His cleansing from our unrighteousness? To know that we are eternally and forever forgiven in Christ Jesus, restored and redeemed in our relationship with our Creator, God, who tells us through the prophet Isaiah that He forgets our sin. It says in Isaiah 43, 25, I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my sake and remembers your sin no more. Friends, if God can remember our sins no more, we must forget them when he cleanses us. For most of the people in this room, this is amazing news. As we all have the opposite problem In that we cannot forget our sins. They haunt us. They follow us. They kind of sit back in our memory waiting to come out in a moment of weakness. But friends, God forgives us completely. Not even giving memory to our past shortcomings and failings. If we confess, He is faithful and just to forgive us. Have you received that promise of forgiveness today? Would you pray with me this morning? God, I thank you for today. I thank you for allowing us to worship together in your name, in your house. And God, I thank you for the promise of forgiveness. Lord, I thank you that we sit in this room, myself included, knowing that we have commonality. God, I'm not happy about the fact that we sin. But God, I am happy that you forgive us of our sins and you cast them as far as the east is from the west. Friend, maybe you're here today and you would say, well, I've received that eternal forgiveness. I've received that forgiveness where Christ cleanses me from my my unrighteousness. But I haven't forgotten it the way that Jesus did. 
And I want you to know that God's calling us to forget it, not relive it, not rehash it. He didn't, with with a woman that committed adultery, he didn't condemn her. He didn't tell her to sit and think about what she had done wrong and figure out how she could do it differently. He said, go and sin no more. He forgave her. Friend, maybe you're in this room today and there's a thought that's in your head. There's no way God can forgive me of this. Friend, I want you to know that there's no condemnation and forgiveness from our Father. And He wants to look at you and say, cast it as far as the east is from the west and go and sin no more. In just a few moments, we're going to sing a song. Oh, come to the altar. Friend, I want you to know that this altar is open. And if you need to ask forgiveness, today is the day. I pray that if God's working in your heart, that you would not walk out of this room the same way that you walked in today. Maybe you're here today and you've never even received the gift of forgiveness. You've never asked Jesus into your heart. You've never understood the fact that Jesus came to this earth to be a substitute for our, the, the penalty of our sin. He went to Calvary and died on a cross, a, a gruesome criminal's death. He was taken off of that cross and laid in a tomb, but the story didn't end there. Because three days later, they rolled the stone, they, they, they went and the stone was rolled away. They walked in and Jesus was not there. Why? Because He had ascended. He had risen from the grave. A few days later, He ascended to the right hand of the Father where He sits and intercedes for you and me today. And He wants to forgive you. He wants to offer you that eternal, forever forgiveness. So friend, if you've never accepted that, I pray that today would be your day of salvation. Maybe you're here today and you feel like you need to unite with this body of believers and doing what God's called us to do, strengthening relationships with God, His church, and the world. If that's you, I'll be here at the front. Friends, this morning, if God's laying something on your heart, if He's working in your, in your mind, in your soul, in your heart, pray that today would be your day of change of accepting that forgiveness and understanding that God doesn't hold it over you the way that you do. And He wants you to run and sin no more. God, thank You for Your promise of forgiveness. It's in Your gracious and loving heavenly name we pray today. Amen. Wherever you are in this room, if God's working on you, I pray that today would be the day that you would respond. We're going to sing this last song. I'd ask you all to stand. Oh, come to the altar. Arms are 
Well, amen. As we uh, close this morning, a few announcements that we have. Uh for you again as Sherry said earlier to connect with us via our app and so you'll see the uh, QR code up there that you can scan and download that app so you can if you're a guest you can fill out a connect card on there Um, and if you're a member here it just keeps you up to speed on everything that's going on uh, as well as you can give through that or you can give uh, in the little box that we have in the back back there. Uh, tomorrow, uh, August the 7th at 1030, we have our teenagers meeting. Uh, we are going to have Jonathan Sweeney from the P- Pell City Police Department will be here to speak. Uh, so make plans to come to that. It's potluck, so bring something with you to eat and to share with everybody for that. Uh, this Wednesday on uh, August the 9th, we have our night of worship, St. Clair County Night of Worship. And so we're super excited that that is here uh, and that we will have several churches here Wednesday night joining us to worship. I encourage you, if you want to come and you're not a teenager, you can still feel welcome to come and worship with us that night. Um, to, today, as the service ends, we got to get everything off this stage. And so if you're able, before rushing off to lunch to help us out, uh, to lend a hand, getting chairs or whatever, please uh, stick back and help us with that. Um, also, next Wednesday night, the 16th, we have our back to school bash uh, for our kids. So if you would um, see Sherry for that um, to get more information, but it's going to be a great time. So make plans to come to that as Kid Venture kicks off on August the 16th. Uh, so let's uh, pray real quick and we'll be dismissed. God, thank you so much for this morning. God, just thank you that you allowed us to be here and over the past uh, few weeks, God, to talk about your goodness. God, it is your goodness that gets us through life every day. Father, we are wretched, miserable people that sin against you daily, yet your grace is sufficient and abounds. May we not take that for granted, but may we be thankful. And Father, I just pray that as as we go today, that you would be with our kids and our students and teachers and administrators, God, as this new school year kicks off, God, I just pray that everybody in those roles would turn to you. I God, I pray that our kids would go into school sharing your message boldly to those around them. And Father, I just pray that you will be with us now as we go. Just help us to be a light in our community. We pray all these things in your name. Amen.